Well, thank you so much for that very, very generous introduction, Eileen. I'll try to live up to all of that. I'll do what I can. Um, so I'll start off by saying I'm not used to using a microphone. Uh, we don't really have those at UIS, so I think I'm going to request that we get them because I think it's wonderful. Uh, so if I wander away from it at any point, I'm kind of a wanderer. Someone just kind of wave at me and I'll come back to the microphone. Uh, so thank you so much to Eileen and to everyone at the ALPLM for giving me this opportunity uh, to be here with you this evening. I'm absolutely thrilled to get the chance uh, to do this talk. Uh, it's really kind of a treat for me as a historian. Of course, every part of my job is delightful. I always love it. Uh, it's always a wonderful thing. But as I've been, <laughs> really, I'm not being sarcastic. Um, <laughs> As the past couple of months have gone by and I've been preparing this presentation, uh, it's been even more delightful than usual because it has literally been my job to pour over 19th century fashion plates uh, and to pour over kind of 1930s period film and look at what Hollywood has done with Civil War era fashion. So when a colleague comes into my office and I'm watching a clip from Gone with the Wind on YouTube, I am actually doing research. Um, so it doesn't really get better than that. Uh, so for this evening, I do have a few central questions that I want us to think and talk about, and I apologize for very literal-mindedly putting them on the PowerPoint. Um, I'm a teacher, and I always like to kind of have things visual that way. Uh, so first and foremost, I do want us to think about what kinds of decisions costume designers are making when they are charged with doing a film about the Civil War. What kinds of decisions are they making in terms of how they costume that film? And if there's anything I've learned from reading costume design theory, it's that every single decision they make is deliberate. It's a choice. So when we're looking at those clothes, we're looking at those garments, what are those decisions? And why are they making them? And when we're looking at those particular kinds of choices, what's accurate and inaccurate here? I mean, where are they hitting the nail on the head? When are they representing the era that they want to represent with complete accuracy, or at least as close to accuracy as we can get? And when are they straying off that path? Uh, when are they diverging from accuracy? And again, why is that happening? Uh, which gets me to you know, my third question, which is, is accuracy actually the absolute most important thing to think about when we're thinking about representations of costume on film? Uh, it's something that for me, you know, as a historian of fashion, it's hard for me to say, that that's not the most important thing. Um, I have friends who will not go to see period films with me because I'm insufferable. <laughs> I'm absolutely terrible. Um, I will nitpick out loud and at length what is wrong with costumes in public. I'm delightful. Uh, so I, for me, accuracy, of course, is very, very important. But in reading costume theory, other things have come up in terms of what costume designers, uh, what theorists have talked about. It's not just about accuracy. It's about all the other things that we expect and want films to do. It's about thinking about the psychology of the character. Uh, it's thinking about kind of trying to push the story forwards. It's actually, in many cases, about trying to speak to the contemporary fashion moment as well, to give viewers something to look at which will resonate as beautiful with them as modern viewers. So how does all of that play into the kinds of decisions, the kinds of things that happen uh, with costumes in film? I love this quote uh, from the costume designer Anne Roth. Uh, she's done the costumes for many different Oscar-winning films, uh, including Cold Mountain, which is a Civil War epic. It had Nicole Kidman, Jude Law in it. Some of you may have seen it. It came out about a decade or so ago. Very problematic as a work of history, uh, but the costumes are gorgeous. And you can see here that she's making a case for her profession in, I think, very entertainingly strong terms of saying, you know, as costume designers, we know that the most important part of a film is how it's costumed. And of course, I think a lot of people would take issue with that quote, as she indicates, when she makes it clear she thinks she'll be killed if she articulates this in public. Uh, but that a lot of what she's saying, I think, has some real reality to it here, that this is something where if the costumes in a film don't work, if they're off, then you notice it. And it does throw off your experience uh, as a viewer of the film. So I think that kind of sense of the importance of costumes and how central they are to our immersion in period film is certainly something that she's absolutely right about here. So when it comes to thinking about kind of costume design and the, the theory of it, it's been a lot of fun for me to get to delve into and to read because the debates within it get really nasty and unpleasant. Uh, people tend to have very strong opinions about what costumes should do, how they should operate in films. It's been a really neat thing to get to read about. Um, and from my reading, the sense that I have is that there are really kind of three central debates that costume designers have when it comes to costuming historical film. What should costumes do? What should they look like? 
And one of them, that first term is actually Anne Roth's term. Uh, should a costume in historical film be a non-event or a showstopper? So should a costume, I mean, think of it as kind of the soundtrack of a film. If you notice the soundtrack of a film, if you're struck by its beauty, by its originality, is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? Should you not be noticing the soundtrack? Should it be blending seamlessly into the background or is it something that you should consciously be paying attention to? Same thing is true for fashion in film. Some costume designers say it should pop out at you. You should remember these dresses. They should be a conscious part of your experience of the film. And some say, well, no, if we're doing our job, the audience isn't going to notice the costumes consciously. They're not going to see them. So should it be a non-event? Should it be a showstopper? It's also that question of something I've already kind of touched on, period authenticity versus kind of modern day fashion, modern day glamour. Uh, when you're creating costumes for screen, is the most important thing to take kind of the Civil War reenactor model, where it's about getting the most accurate fabrics you can. It's about making sure you replicate in every detail, as much as you possibly can, what these costumes actually would have looked like. Or is it more about making them something which will resonate with modern viewership? If everyone in an era wore drab, gray dresses, if that's what your character would have actually worn, but you're afraid that's gonna put your audience to sleep, as a costume designer, do you punch it up? Do you make it actually brighter and more vivid and something which is going to stand out to a modern audience more? Or do you stick with what it actually would have been with complete accuracy? It's something costume designers absolutely have to grapple with. And that final issue is about kind of realism versus symbolism. So if you want to trace the evolution of your character's kind of psychological development over the course of a film, she's gone from being a kind of a shy wallflower to being a bold socialite, and you want to trace that in terms of the clothing that she's wearing. So you want to have her start out wearing kind of drab sort of grays and browns, and you want her to graduate to sort of bright reds and oranges and make that very vivid. Well, that might be a good kind of interesting psychological way of doing it. It might give you insight into her character, but if you're thinking about the reality of a film, say set in the 19th century, where most you know, even middle class women would have had very small wardrobes. They wouldn't have had access to a lot in the way of different kinds of clothing. So do you go with what you want to do, kind of trying to express the evolution of her character, move the plot forward through clothing? Or again, do you stick to what actually would have been the case, where what you're doing is showing that she wouldn't have had much of a wardrobe to work with? All these issues, things costume designers have to think and talk about. Decided for the purposes of this talk uh, to focus on historical costumes and films in the 1930s. And I promise I didn't do that just because the 1930s are my favorite um, and I love 1930s film. I think I actually do have some legitimate reasons to back this up. Uh, partly having to do with what's happening in the film industry in the 1930s and partly what's happening in American culture more broadly in the 1930s. Uh, the 1930s is really a uh, fascinating era in the history of film, and it's a time in which the Hollywood industry is changing in some really fundamental and significant ways. That's certainly happening in terms of costume design. Uh, up until this point, things had been a little bit more piecemeal in terms of how costumes came together for films. Uh, it wasn't really until D.W. Griffith gave you the poster from one of his films, America, on the right there, uh, begins his film careers working in the 19-teens and 1920s, that he wants to kind of systematize how costumes for films are done, uh, to have the, you know someone fully on staff who's in charge of designing costumes, that there's a staff of folks who are on hand to put those costumes together. Uh, even into the 19-teens and 1920s, that's kind of slapdash in terms of how that happens sometimes. Uh, costuming, it still did happen where actors would be told, and you will provide your own costume. So come to work in whatever you have that you think looks like the 1850s, and we'll go with that. As you can imagine, that didn't always turn out too well. Uh, but by the 1930s, it's completely different. Uh, we have the professionalization of costume departments. So any major studio worth its salt is going to have a significant costume department. It's going to have a full-time costume designer who works there. Uh, and they're going to have a very talented staff of sewers and of dressmakers who are going to bring those visions to life. So I think that's an interesting moment, part of what makes the 1930s so significant in film history. Uh, it's also significant, I think, that Film, the connections between film and fashion are really developing in some intriguing ways during this decade, uh, that we do see really strong tie-ins between the media and the way that fashion and film is covered, and also uh, in terms of commercialization of covering, oh dear. I don't use, I'm not used to using clickers either, so I love this, I'm gonna steal it, but I'm also not too adept in using it. 
there we go. Uh, in terms of kind of how film is talked and thought about, we see a lot, a lot, a lot of advertising and stories coming up in film publications in the 1930s that talk about fashion and film. Uh, not only that, you can actually go to, if you are lucky enough to live in a major city, to these cinema shops, they're dress shops where you can go and they have reproductions of the gowns that you've seen in you know, the film that was just at your local, I was gonna say multiplex, that's not a 1930s term, we'll go with theater. Um, you can buy a reproduction of it right then and there. And that includes not only contemporary films, it also includes period films. Uh, so there's a real kind of commercial incentive for costume designers to, when they're designing dresses for screen, to do so with an eye to the marketplace, uh, to be thinking about what might American women want in terms of the kinds of clothing they might want to buy. And that includes pattern companies. Uh, there are a lot of companies that start to make patterns so that if you can't go to a cinema shop and buy yourself a dress based after the gown in your favorite film, uh, you can actually buy a pattern that will do that. And that dress on the right, uh, it's often called the barbecue dress from Gone with the Wind. It's the most popular pattern based on a movie dress in the 1930s. Uh, it's the best seller, bar none. Uh, the dress gets made and remade and remade. Apparently a lot of women used it as their wedding dress. Uh, so you can see that there's this kind of desire to link these two things, link the fashion industry and link the film industry. So it puts kind of a new pressure in some ways on costume designers to make clothing which they think could conceivably uh, be marketable to a contemporary audience. So just also in terms, I think the historical context is interesting. We're thinking about the 1930s and a film because of course uh, this is the era, this is the Great Depression and majority of Americans are struggling economically. Uh, many Americans are losing their jobs, don't have a lot in the way of financial resources. So when it comes to how Americans are spending their leisure time, uh, film is in many ways an attractive option because it's relatively affordable. I've given you some kinds of prices there just to give you a sense of, you know, if you wanted to, you know, in your leisure time go out and, and shop versus go and see a movie in which you can watch other people shop, uh, you can see the differential there is really significant. If you're a, a woman, you might not be able to buy yourself a new dress, but you can go to the theater and look at the most beautiful dresses in the world. Uh, so certainly I think the fact that a really high percentage of Americans are going to the movies in the 1930s makes 1930s film interesting to look at. Um, and also during the 30s, we're coming up on the 75th anniversary of the outbreak of the Civil War. Uh, so it's something that we see a real spike upwards in terms of nonfiction books, fictional works, kind of grapplings with on the part of the American public what the Civil War meant uh, to America as a country. And so uh, film certainly reflects that. We have a pretty significant number of films set in the Civil War era, which come out in the 1930s, which are kind of responding to that desire on the part of Americans to think about, reflect on this time uh, in American history. So when we're thinking about um, how the Civil War era and its fashions are represented in 1930s film, I think there are two kind of divergent strains that we can see. And one of them is this very earnest striving for accuracy, uh, the desire on the part of the costume designers who work on these films to try to get things right. They really want to. Uh, they do a lot of research, they put a lot of time and thought into their costumes, and what they want to do for their viewers is they want to bring them back into that vanished world. So certainly part of what they want to do is give the most accurate picture they can of what women in the 1930s would have been wearing. And one man who's uh, very much responsible for helping to do that is the costume designer Walter Plunkett. Uh, as you can see there, I've given you the little nickname he was often known by in the industry. Uh, he's the king of the period picture. So if you were a director and you wanted to do a period film in the 1930s, 1940s, 1950s, you couldn't do better than Walter Plunkett. He was your go-to guy. He was the man whom you wanted to have design the costumes for your film. Uh, he had a very, very meticulous eye. He cared tremendously about detail. Uh, he costumes two of the most famous and successful Civil War era films from the 1930s, uh, Little Women from 1933, and of course, Gone with the Wind in 1939. And for little women, he, quite obsessively actually, uh, went to as many textile mills as he possibly could uh, before he found a textile mill in Pennsylvania that made the kinds of textiles it made, had made in the 1860s because that's the kind of textile he wanted for the dresses in little women. So again, that attention to detail. 
Uh, in Gone with the Wind, he traveled the South uh, while he was researching the costumes for the film, uh, met with women, kind of asked them to rummage through their attics, pull out their great-grandmother's dresses for him to look at. He poured over period photographs. He looked at a lot of contemporary, you know, meaning 1860s fashion magazines. And he became a real thorn in Margaret Mitchell, the author of Gone with the Wind's uh, side, because he would call her from the set of Gone with the Wind a lot. Um, he would keep calling her and say, well, what, how would Melanie tie the ribbons on her bonnet? And if in this particular, if she's going to a picnic, would Scarlett have long gloves or short gloves? And Mitchell's like, oh my god, stop calling me. Um, she eventually stopped taking his calls uh, because he was such a pest. Uh, but he had that kind of obsessive desire to try to get everything right, get the details right, do the research. You can see in Little Women, I've given you a quote from the director of the film there, where he's kind of praising Plunkett for the attention to detail, not just in terms of how the clothes were made, but also in terms of how the clothes appear on screen. So if you've seen this film version of Little Women, if you haven't, I recommend it. It's fantastic. Uh, he does really try to make it so that you know the March family, who are at the center of the film, they don't have that much money. The fact that they're economically struggling is a central part of the story. And he, Plunkett wants that to be represented in the costumes. So you'll see some of the dresses, some of the accessories rotate among the female characters. You know, the four March sisters, they'll all wear the same dress over the course of the film. So he wants to you know, represent their economic status through their clothes. Gone with the Wind, as you can see from the quote that I gave you there. Um, I think Plunkett's definitely selling himself short in terms of how he's framing what he did on that film, saying, I think in frustration that in the end, this movie had nothing to do with history. Um, I don't think that's strictly true, uh, but I do think that reflects the frustration that he had in dealing with the director of Gone with the Wind, uh, David Selznick, who, interestingly for someone who's you know directing the most <laughs> significant period film of the 30s, he didn't really care about period detail and accuracy. He wanted to tell this kind of rip-roaring, wonderful story that would draw viewers in. Whether or not the buttons were right on Scarlett O'Hara's dress, he didn't care. Uh, so he and Plunkett, butted heads constantly during the filming of Gone with the Wind. And as we'll see, uh, sometimes Selznick went out and sometimes Plunkett did. Uh, it really does vary a lot. I think something that both of these films, something Plunkett does tremendously well, is trying to replicate what kind of opulent high fashion would have looked like, what evening wear would have looked like in the 1860s. I'm giving you photos from uh, Little Women on the left and Gone with the Wind on the right. You can see these kind of very, very opulent sort of evening dresses. They're in these light colors that, of course, you know, Light colors are the purview of the wealthy because they'd be easily soiled uh, in day-to-day -day business. The very, very full hoop skirts, all the ruffling at the bottom of these skirts, and the very detailed kind of ruffled bodice that Scarlett O'Hara is wearing on her kind of dress on the right there. And every time I see that dress especially, I think, wouldn't Mary Todd Lincoln have loved that dress. She would have loved it. She would have died to wear it. And it also would have made sense to her. If she had seen that dress in Godey's Lady's Book, it wouldn't have looked odd to her. It wouldn't have looked out of line with the high fashions that were popular during the 1860s. Of course, that's Todd Lincoln on the right. And I apologize to both of them for doing this. That's Verena Davis, who's the first lady of the Confederacy on the left, never together on the same slide until now. Um, but you can see the detailing here that those dresses it really, really resonates. You can tell that Plunkett was looking at these kinds of photographs. Again, these are evening dresses. They're in light colors. They have those very, very full hoop skirts. They have all the ruffled detailing at the hem. And that bodice, it's kind of a V-neck going downwards. He hits it absolutely point for point. And you see that reflected in the fashions represented in the kind of premier, pioneering fashion periodical, Godey's Ladies Book of the 1860s, uh, in terms of their representations of what women in high society would be wearing. It's exactly the same kinds of dresses. It has all those details. They're the same color. They have the same kind of cut. They have the same detailing. Uh, so is this something that middle class Joe March from Little Women would have had access to? Would she be swanning around in a white, opulent ball gown? Of course not. Scarlett O'Hara, maybe. They had some financial resources at the beginning of the film anyway. But it's certainly not representative of the reality in many ways of what these women would have been wearing. But he does an excellent job of reflecting the fantasy of it, of what high society women would have been wearing in the 1860s. And of course, no talk on 19th century fashion is complete without scary hoop skirt pictures. So I wanted to give you those. Um, something when I asked my students to kind of think about you know, representations of 19th century clothing on film, and I asked them, what, what do you think is off here? And they always say, the hoop skirts, they're too big. Women didn't really wear ones that big. They have to be exaggerated. 
Um, and of course, they're right when you're talking about working class women, middle class women. Uh, it certainly wasn't practical to wear a hoop skirt that's that opulent and huge uh, if you're bustling around, working, taking care of a household. If you're an elite woman, however, the films aren't actually exaggerating, as you can see, that much. Uh, that hoop skirts are indeed as expansive as Plunkett represents them as being in Gone with the Wind and Little Women. Uh, and in fact, their expansiveness is something that satirists love to take hold of uh, in the 19th century, as you can see, ridiculing women. As you can see in the top left there for wearing a hoop skirt so huge, no one can even talk to her. They can't even get near her. Um, and unfortunately, the, the right image is sadly has some basis in fact, the fact that women's skirts, you know, they're so, so elaborate, the hoop skirts are so huge, you can't really tell necessarily where you are in this skirt, and that you might, you might catch on fire, and women indeed did, and you can imagine hard to get out of a hoop skirt before flames move upwards. So in terms of how he hits the kind of evening wear in these films, hits it out of the park. Well, what about day dresses? What about the things that these female characters are wearing in their kind of average day-to-day -day lives? I think he does a sensational job here as well. I've given you all stills from Gone with the Wind here of Scarlett O'Hara and Melanie Hamilton. You can see things have been kind of scaled back here. The hoop is not quite as expansive. The colors are much more practical. Uh, they're darker. It's a much more simple dress. There's not a lot of detailing on the skirt. There's not really a lot of ornamentation anywhere. There's just some kind of very simple collar and detailing at the throat. Otherwise, very kind of simple, stripped down kind of dresses. And you can really tell, I think, in looking at those dresses and at the photographs of women in the 1860s, that he looked at these photographs. I mean, he really paid attention to what women were wearing. You see that those dresses and the ones that Scarlett and Melanie are wearing, they have a lot of resonance in terms of the cut, the size of the hoop skirt, the kind of fabric, the detailing very slight at the neck. That right picture always makes me sad. She looks so sad. So project, think about that image with her smiling, because I wish she was. Uh, certainly that detailing, these dresses are, again, they're very simple. They're very basic. They have a hoop skirt, but it's smaller. And that's absolutely what Plunkett is representing here. So he has nailed that kind of daily sort of dress that, again, a more wealthy, certainly a middle class woman would have been wearing. But he hits that. And again, no talk about 19th century fashion is complete without scary corset pictures, so have those for you as well. And you can see, too, he gets the silhouette right in a lot of how he represents these garments. You kind of saw how those dresses were fitted, both for the day dresses and the evening dresses. There's a lot, of course, famously for Gone with the Wind, there's a lot of attention paid to the waist. Uh, these are corsets that are very much cinched around the waist, emphasize the fullness of the bust, fullness of the hips, uh, and that it influences how the dresses fit. And you can see, of course, we have several famous corseting scenes in Gone with the Wind, and you can see the actual corset that he constructed. And it, it looks very similar, as you can see, to the actual ones that women would have been wearing. So he not only gets the day-to-day -day wear right, he gets the undergarments right. And definitely need to do that in historical film. However, I saved the nitpicking for last, that's my favorite part. Uh, there is a lot that happens in 1930s film in terms of how it represents the 19th century. That is not accurate at all. That strays very, very far away from that. And I don't think that's an error. Uh, I don't think that it's something that costume designers were doing not knowing what they were doing. Uh, I think it was definitely a conscious decision on their part. But they definitely are straying very far away uh, from what 19th century fashion would have looked like. They're doing that in many, many different ways. You can see uh, fashion scholars often say, if you're looking at period film and you want to know what's wrong, start at the top. Hats. Hats are almost always off. Hair and makeup, as you can see here. Um, Scarlett O'Hara is actually very fashion forward in this image. She's wearing what will become a very popular hairstyle in the 1940s. That's 1940s. Uh, and you can see the still from Little Women here, the promotional shot. That's straight up and down 1930s makeup. They have very, very high arched eyebrows. They have waved hair. They have a very well-defined dark lip. Not something women in the 1860s would have been doing. So you have hair and makeup, as we'll get to. Uh, and Eileen kind of promised you the bust, how that's handled. Uh, that came out wrong. But you know what I mean, how that's represented uh, in film. <laughs> Erase that last part from your memory. Um, that's something that also always goes wrong. And budget, uh, in terms of how these clothes are represented. Could women have actually afforded to dress in the way they do on film? And the answer is almost always uh, no, they can't. So Gone with the Wind, uh, something that, again, this is where we get into the Selznick versus Plunkett kind of controversies, and we see Selznick winning out more than Plunkett. You can see in these dresses, there's a lot of really bold 
strong geometric detailing. We have that amazing kind of striped dress that Scarlett's wearing with the kind of striped cuff. And that very, it's so unflattering, it's a terrible dress. Uh, but that kind of very odd geometric kind of pattern that's on the neckline sleeves at the kind of edge of the dress. Very bold, very geometric, making a very kind of definite sort of mathematical pattern on these dresses. Um, does that resonate with 1860s fashion? Not so much. Uh, you saw some of the 1860s dresses in the previous slides. Uh, there certainly was room for pattern, usually not in that kind of detached, bold kind of way. It absolutely resonates with 1930s fashion, though. You can see I've given you some kind of images from 1930s patterns and fashion plates, the idea of kind of bold, striped, patterned garments. That's something that a 1930s viewer would have looked at and said, oh, that looks chic. But in 1860s, not that 1860s viewers could have seen movies, but you know what I mean, uh, they would not have recognized that. It would not have resonated with them in the same way. Little Women, uh, again, started off by telling you how meticulous Plunkett was in many ways in trying to replicate what 1860s fashion would look like when he's putting this film together. And again, in many ways, he does a fantastic job. I mean, that dress there is the dress that Katherine Hepburn as Joe March wears throughout much of the film. You can see it's, it's very true to what a middle class woman would have been wearing. It's very simple. It's a very simple pattern. The textiles are accurate to the period. So there's a lot that's right about what he does. There's also a lot that resonates more with who Katherine Hepburn was as a movie star and what's happening in 1930s fashion. Uh, I love the still on the left. You can see that, you know, obviously we have kind of an in-process sort of shot on set of Little Women, and she's got her hands shoved in her pockets. She has pockets to shove her hands into, which would an 1860s woman have had external high pockets like that? Probably not. <laughs> we're in an era in which the idea of having a pocket, it breaks the line of the dress. So we're seeing kind of purses, reticules coming into fashion more. You would not necessarily have had those large kinds of pockets. Those resonate much more with what's happening in 1930s fashion. And you can see, too, in the film, she does wear these kinds of, they look almost like men's blazers as kind of very tweedy, sort of menswearish type pieces. And I love that when this film was distributed in France, uh, they just ran with that. They didn't even use any images. That image you see of Hepburn, that's not from Little Women. Um, they just picked a picture of her and chose to advertise the film that way. They just discarded Little Women altogether. Clearly kind of resonating with more with Hepburn and who she was and the kind of image that she projected as a movie star, which was very much about kind of popularizing that sort of casual menswearish type of fashion. She's one of the first female movie stars to do that. And it's something that, you know, we see obviously it resonates with the character of Joe March as well. For those of you who read Little Women, and I hope all of you have, it's a fantastic book. Uh, she's kind of a tomboy. She's kind of seen as masculine throughout the book. Uh, so by kind of giving the Joe March of the film version of Little Women these sort of menswearish touches, giving her sort of menswear looking blazer tops, by giving pockets to put her fingers and her hands into, it speaks to, to Hepburn's image as a kind of tomboyish movie star. It speaks to Joe March as a character. It doesn't really speak to what's happening in 1860s fashion culture. It's definitely a departure there. I hope some of you in the crowd, it would be the perfect crowd to assume some of you might have seen this. Uh, it's D.W. Griffith's 1930 film, Abraham Lincoln. Fascinating on many levels, though disturbing to see what the man who wrote Birth of a Nation does with the story of Lincoln. It's definitely kind of a disconnect there. Uh, so you can see I've given you the poster for that film and a still from it. Uh, it's often, it's really framed primarily as a love story uh, between Lincoln and Anne Rutledge, which of course will get Lincoln scholars talking in and of itself. Um, you can see in the poster for the film, there's been some kind of concession uh, to period here. You know, she's wearing a fuller skirt. Her bodice seems kind of simple. It seems like it's kind of 1860s-ish in terms of how she's being presented. If you look at what actually happens in the film, however, how she's dressed, not quite so much. You can see she's wearing sleeveless, first of all, 19th century, don't so much do the kind of sleeveless. She's got these very, very short sleeves. It's a sheer floral fabric. She's got this kind of ruffle at her neck. She's wearing a jaunty little hat. All of those things, as we'll talk about, off base when we're thinking about the 1860s. Another prominent film set in the Civil War era, um, 1933's Secrets. The movie poster is deceptive for lots of reasons. It kind of looks like a lighthearted romantic romp, I think, from the poster, but it's actually kind of a sort of would-be realist grim look at life on the frontier in the 19th century, so viewers of this film might have felt kind of cheated if they were going and looking at this poster. 
Uh, they also would have been cheated, as you can see from the promotional photos here in the posters, if they went in looking for an accurate representation of the 1860s. I mean, Mary Pickford, who's the star here, she looks to me kind of like a glamorous sort of flight attendant of the 1930s in terms of how she's dressed. Look at her hat, the way her hair is waved. She has this very kind of elaborate, this huge bow at her neck. It's all very kind of dashing and modern looking, but we're talking modern 1930s, uh, not modern. 1860s, and again, look at her hair. Her hair is bobbed. I mean, she has a bobbed haircut, which, again, 1860s, not quite so much. So in terms of the floral, the kind of light, you know, short-sleeved, flowy floral dress that the star Una Merkel of Abraham Lincoln's wearing here, it's dead on in terms of late 1920s, early 1930s fashion, those kinds of dresses where they're loosely fitting, they're made of kind of sheer materials, they have a floral pattern, they have a low scooped neck, all of those things fit. But of course, would a lady of the 19th century have been wearing something that did not have sleeves in public? No. Would she have been wearing a low neckline in public in the daytime? No. So again, this is something that as a viewer in 1930, you might have thought how smart and fashionable, but a little bit off base. That giant bow that Mary Pickford has at her neck, that kind of sort of dashing accent, resonated a lot. You can see in 1930s fashion that kind of having that as a central accent of a piece, of a dress, or of a blouse. That's something that came up a goodish amount. Don't see it quite as much in 1860s fashion. And of course, the hats. The hats are, I think, fantastic. I want them. They have nothing to do with the 1860s. That kind of dashing piece that Mary Pickford's wearing is kind of central black square on the center of her head. As you can see, certainly something a 1930s woman might have worn. And that sort of jaunty little boater type hat on an angle pops up everywhere. It's very, very common in 1930s fashion. But uh, really, I think they did that because they didn't want her to wear a bonnet. Uh, they wanted her to have something that would look more modern, would resonate more with modern audiences. But in reality, she would have been wearing something that shaded her face. I mean, if you're a white woman in the 19th century, staying pale was what you wanted to do. Uh, but here, she's kind of exposed to the sun, arms and all. And of course the hair, um, completely, really blatantly off in these films. Mary Pickford, that's actually a photo of her uh, over on the right. She just kept her own hairstyle. Uh, it's very tightly waved, it's very kind of short. Uh, there's really not much effort to even kind of pretend that she has her hair back in a bun. It's just this very short kind of modern 1930s hairstyle. So again, this is very much more about what might resonate with a, a contemporary audience watching these, these films in the 1930s, kind of signaling to us that our heroines are these kind of modern, fashionable young women, but they're fashionable in 1930s terms, uh, not in 1860s terms. When it comes to evening wear, I spent so much time talking about how great Plunkett was, what a wonderful job he did in terms of how he kind of put evening dresses together. And that's certainly true in lots of ways and in many cases. Uh, there are some kind of slippings off the path here as well. Uh, the 1938 film, Jezebel, it's kind of a, a pity project for Betty Davis. She really, really, really wanted to be Scarlett O'Hara, obviously, didn't get the part. Uh, so her studio said, well, all right, we'll write another story for you about a feisty Southern belle and her romantic troubles, and that, that film is Jezebel. And this is the dress that she's wearing when she debuts as a debutante. And you can't tell uh, because, of course, it's black and white film, it's a black and white photo, but much is made in the film of the fact this dress is red. She's wearing a red dress to her debutante ball, obviously. One or two things wrong with that, as we'll discuss. You can see they've made some concessions to uh, 1860s fashion here. The, the dress itself at the bottom has some ruffling. It's kind of a full skirt, so that part of the silhouette seems all right. Uh, we get to the bodice of it. It's this very fitted, corseted bodice that emphasizes the bust. And you can't really tell. I couldn't get a photo. You can see it the best on the, the poster for the film. It's also pretty much backless. Uh, there's really not much of a back to it. So it doesn't just go into a V. It pretty much disappears altogether uh, when she turns around. So it's very dramatic sort of evening dress. Similarly dramatic, and because David Selznick pushed for Technicolor, we can tell this dress is red. Uh, one of Scarlett O'Hara's evening dresses, even less, I think, desire to kind of speak to the 1860s here. The skirt isn't even, as you can see, when the dress is on its own. It's pretty straight up and down. It's really not full at all. There's no crinoline. There's no hoop skirts. Uh, the kinds of fabric that's used, the sort of sparkles, all the wonderful feathers that she has, and the kind of tulle she has as a shrug, 
very visually dramatic would have been dead on for a 1930s lounge singer. Um, but of course, this is Scarlett O'Hara we're talking about. All of these things, again, they're signaling a lot of things to us as viewers about who these women are. These are both kind of scandalous female characters. They're very bold in their sexuality. And the fact they're wearing red and that they're wearing low-cut dresses and that their breasts are being emphasized, all that, it tells us that. It takes us way far away from the 1860s, though. You can see the kind of fashion for, for backless dresses, very prominent in the 1930s. You can see Betty Davis, actually, she, she liked her back a lot. She liked to show it in her films. Uh, it's something that was still kind of daring uh, for you to do as evening wear, but if you were kind of a fashion-forward woman in the 1930s, you might well have an evening dress like Betty Davis's character uh, in Jezebel that would be very low in the back uh, if it had much of a back at all. And you can see, again, uh, the bust. Really, it's getting very strongly emphasized here in terms of the corseting. Uh, women's breasts are definitely being highlighted. I was going to say put forward, but again, ignore that. I'm trying not to use that language. Uh, you can see in the photos from the 1860s themselves, that's not happening. Uh, the bust is not being emphasized in that way. You can see what the corseting does. We looked at scary corset pictures before, and you can see how dresses would have actually fit. It's more about emphasizing the smallness of the waist than anything else. You can see that kind of very definite corseted bodice that fits the way kind of more of a modern bra would fit. That resonates a lot with 1930s evening dresses. So again, it's telling us as viewers in the 1930s, this is a fashionable garment, this is a fashionable person, but doing so by stepping away from the era in question. And sparkles, um, spangles and kind of sequins are something that they're not entirely absent from the marketplace in the 1860s. They're not things that especially young women going to their debutante balls would have worn. Uh, but glamorous film stars in the 1930s, that's Anna Mae Wong, Marlena Dietrich, and Loretta Young, they would have worn. Uh, so giving them to Scarlett O'Hara gives her that kind of enhanced sort of glamour. So again, we kind of see, I think, character development, telling us something about who these women are in these films, being emphasized through clothes, uh, not doing so in ways if 1860s viewers had seen this, they would have been appalled, uh, number one, and they would not have seen themselves in it uh, at all. And I think uh, that's something that, again, is partly a conscious choice in terms of what costume designers are doing. Uh, Walter Plunkett was, as I've said, he's very dedicated to authenticity as much as possible, but he also did have all those other things in mind. I've given you a quote from him here about how he worked, that he did want to kind of start out with the period, he did want to talk about the historical period in question, but that he did, to some extent, feel comfortable of taking things away that he felt dated it. If it's, which is interesting, we think about historical film, dating it's kind of the point. Uh, but that he wants to do away with those elements that seem like they're taking us too far into the past. A lot of costume theorists use the term fashion language. That you have to speak to an audience in a fashion language they understand. And that 1930s viewers, if you want to get across the point that Scarlett O'Hara is a dangerous, glamorous woman, you can't necessarily use 1860s fashion language to do that. What's dangerous and glamorous then might not translate, so you have to kind of knock that part of it off and translate it into 1930s terms. And that's Plunkett that something did do. He wanted to, you know, viewers to have some kind of a visual experience that was pleasant. He wanted them to like what they saw, to regard it as smart and fashionable. And again, I do think it's also worthwhile keeping in mind, you know, I started off the talk kind of talking about how the 1930s is an era in which marketing fashion and film is something that's really coming into its own and I think that that's something costume designers are very mindful of that they want these dresses to be dresses that women might want uh, to wear and to buy. Uh, the fashion designer Marcel Rosas um, has a quote he's talking about little women here where he's talking about it not as a film he's not interested in it as a story or a narrative he's interested in thinking about well, what does this mean for the fashion moment and he's saying this this movie was great because it brought us something different into the fashion landscape it brought us a new kind kind of clothing uh, for women to wear. So he's kind of making the distinction here between costume design, which is meant to kind of bring us as viewers into the period in question, and fashion design. He's saying actually costume designers are fashion designers. They're designing clothes that are meant to be worn uh, in the present moment. So obviously a very different sense of what, what costume means and how it operates. So again, I'm sorry for having my final thoughts actually in black and white uh, on the PowerPoint. I'm a teacher, we do that kind of thing. Uh, so what in the end can we kind of make of the ways in which fashions are represented on film? 
uh, and very contradictorily, since I've just been talking about all of the different things that these films get wrong in many ways in terms of their representations of the past, I do think they can play a tremendously powerful role in helping us to visualize that past. Uh, film is such a visual medium, and it can, in a way that a lot of other things can't, help us to get some flawed sense of what the past might have looked like. Uh, it's different looking at a film of women moving in these costumes, uh, wearing these corsets, wearing these hoop skirts, trying to talk and move in them, than it is looking at a picture of those kinds of garments on a page. Uh, film gives it movement, it visualizes it. It does help to draw us in to giving us some sense of what a vanished world might have looked like. Of course, that's always imperfect. Uh, it's never going to be complete because it's always going to be modern designers who are interpreting it, uh, modern dressmakers who are making the dress, modern people who are wearing these clothes. Uh, so even if they've been trained to walk and move the way that a Victorian woman would have, they're still a modern person and that's going to come into what they're doing and how they're acting and how they're sitting. Uh, so I think that part of what fashion and film can also do for us is help us to think about how we see the past, how we interpret it, how we ourselves imagine it. When we look at fashions you know, from the Civil War era as interpreted by 1930s costume designers, I think we can learn something really interesting about the fashions of that time period, of what it would have meant to be a woman in these societies and wear these garments. But of course, it can tell us, I think, as much about, if not more than uh, that, kind of about the Victorian era, it can teach us about the 1930s uh, and what was seen as beautiful, what was seen as glamorous, what did viewers want to look at, what resonated with them, and how did they think about this time period? What did they think about what women were wearing and what they were doing? So fashion and film can't help us to recreate perfectly or recapture the past, uh, but it certainly can help us imagine it. All right, thank you.